through 13. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 13. And when you have it, please say, Amen. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 10 through 13, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in, heavenly, in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand. For just a few moments, we want to talk about winning in the midst of chaos. Winning in the midst of chaos. After the songs that the praise team sung, I feel like I ought to name this winning in the midst of war. God is faithful. Some of us today might acknowledge that we are fighting the most significant war of our lives. Faced with financial challenges, the enemy is attacking us in so many different areas of our lives, our finances, marriages, the church, Christianity in general. We see all of this chaos going on in the world. And for some, we don't even have to look past our own front door <laughs> to see that there is a war going on. And so for just a few moments, God challenges us today as believers to examine the backdrop behind winning when you're surrounded by chaos. The text this morning presents three questions to us. The first question is, where is God in the midst of the chaos? Number two, how is the Christian guaranteed victory in the midst of chaos? And number three, what is the role of the believer when encountering chaos? Now to understand these three questions and their answers, we've got to examine a couple of things here in the book of Ephesians. Throughout his series, Pastor uh, Minister Justin has been talking about the book of Ephesians and he's been carrying us on a journey of the church through transition. And here in the book of Ephesians, we learn that Paul is talking to the church because he wants to encourage them. And so Paul is telling us in this book, who we are before we come to Christ. He's telling us who we are after we give our lives to Christ. And then he's telling us how to live a life of victory after we become believers. So by the time we get to chapter 6, Paul is giving us a solution in living out a life in Christ. This is the, the remedy. And so let's look at verse 12. He says, for our struggle, or for we wrestle not in the King James Version, it's not against flesh and blood. Rulers, it's against rulers, authorities, powers of darkness in this world, spiritual forces of evil. And then he says very specifically, in the heavenly realm. Now when I was reading this this week, I, I actually got stuck in this part because I think I've so often just passed it up. In the heavenly realm. Now, to back up, struggle means engaged in conflict, determined to get out of something, you're constrained, you're really trying to break free. 
He says all this is happening in the heavenly realm. The heavenly realm is mentioned five times in the book of Ephesians. And so I got stuck. I said, why is the heavenly realm mentioned five times in the book of Ephesians? The heavenly realm, when it's defined, it is defined in the Greek as the sphere of spiritual activity or the spiritual realities in spiritual dimensions. So heavenly denotes a place higher than an earthly one, and the realm means it, cont it contextualizes the place as being under the rule and reign of God. Let me say that again. Heavenly is a place higher than an earthly one, and the realm means that it's a place under the rule and reign of God. So now that we understand what the heavenly realm is, let's examine these five times that Paul talks about it. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, Paul says these words. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realm with every spiritual blessing. So the first thing Paul tells us is that in this, in this heavenly realm, it's the place that our blessings reside. That means that, in the, that before the blessing reaches you, it's already residing in the heavenly realm. It's already residing in a place that is under the rule and authority of God which means that it is already available before it reaches you. The next place we see the heavenly realm is that if we go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 and 20, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his uncomparable great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength that exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand, where? In the heavenly realm. Christ is seated in the heavenly realm. The third place we see heavenly realm is in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in where? The heavenly realm. Our position as sons and daughters of God is immediate when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and that is what gives us access to kingdom living while living here on the earth. That's in the heavenly realm. In the heavenly realm, because Jesus is seated in the heavenly realm, our reservation for heaven has already been confirmed the moment Jesus took his seat in the heavenly realm. Which means that all of the blessings, forgiveness, uh, redemption, all of that has been secured once we make Jesus Christ our Lord and our Savior. The fourth place that we see the heavenly realm in Ephesians is Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8 through 11. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of his mystery, of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. Now listen here in verse 10. His intent was that now, 
through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities, where? In the heavenly realm. In other words, the purpose of the church to make Christ known was set and established first in the heavenly realm before it was built on the earth. In other words, the pastor doesn't define the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church has already been as defined before the church was built on the earth. And the good thing about that is that it resides in the heavenly realm, which means that it resides under the rule and the authority of God. Can I get a witness in the house today? The purpose of the church resides in the heavenly realm, which means that in the same way that the enemy seeks to attack us individually from accessing our blessings, he also enjoys scheming to attack the church corporately because God has placed this missional purpose upon the church to go out and make disciples. The last place that we see the heavenly realm is here in Ephesians chapter 6. And here Paul says our struggles not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, powers of this dark age, dark world, spiritual forces of evil, where? That's a lot going on in the heavenly realm. And we look around and we wonder, why is there so much chaos? Our adversary, Satan, and his demonic forces are actively engaged in the heavenly realm seeking to devour us. We have an enemy according to 1 Peter chapter 5 and 8. In Revelations 12 and 10 tells us that Satan is accusing us before God day and night. Jesus himself tells us in John chapter 10 verse 10 the enemy comes to steal to kill and to destroy. As believers, we must accept that we have an enemy and his name is Satan, Beelzebub, the devil, whatever you want to call him, the bottom line is he don't like you. He is 100% evil. Now let's think about that. Not 25%. You know how we go on our jobs and we're applying to these jobs and they give you a list and they break down the percentages of, you know, what you're supposed to do administratively and technical work and all that. They break the percentage down. On the devil's job description, 100% of his job is to be evil. That's all he knows how to do, which means that we can't go around compromising and playing around with the devil when 100% of what he was put on this earth to do is to wreak havoc in your life. Why do we play around with the devil? Every attack that he sends to you and your family and your children on your job, in your mind, in your health, everything he sends your way, it was meant to take you out. It wasn't meant to scare you. It wasn't meant to make you feel like I'll get through this and keep going. He didn't send it to play. He sent it to kill you. Pastor Tony Evans says it like this about Satan. He says, the battle Christians face every day is rooted in the schemes of the devil in his effort to deceive us he is happy for you to picture him as a cartoon character wearing a red jumpsuit with horns and carrying a pitchfork so that you won't take him seriously meanwhile like an opposing football team he watches your game film knows your history studies your weak spots knows your sin patterns 
His goal is to keep you from experiencing God's best life for you. But the Bible declares that no matter how big and bad the devil might think he is, the Bible declares in Isaiah 54, 17, that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. In Psalms 91, verse 9 through 11, he says, because you are made by the Lord and you've made the Lord your dwelling place, the most high who is your refuge, there shall no evil befall thee. Neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For the Lord will command his angels concerning you. You. Believers today, we've got to accept that you're covered. You're not alone. <laughs> In these scriptures in Ephesians, Paul is saying, wake up and accept the reality of the dimensions and the conditions that we have to live in every single day. And based on these scriptures, we can conclude that while we are residing here physically on the earth, there's a lot happening and the spiritual realm to create chaos in your life. And although the book of, all throughout this book, Paul is setting the stage to get us to chapter six. I've always rushed through that. Can I just be honest? I've rushed through the first five chapters trying to get to putting on the armor without really examining why I needed the armor on. And now that I've considered all the things happening in the, in the spiritual realm, I sat and I said to myself, God, I get it. We've got to suit up because there's a war going on before it starts disrupting our lives. God is at work. The enemy is trying to do what he can do to stop you. The church's purpose is there. We see all of these things in the heavenly realm. And we wonder why there's so much chaos in our lives. We wonder why there's so much chaos in the world. There's a lot of spiritual forces happening. That's a lot to create chaos. So then by the time we get to Ephesians 6 and 10, Paul is telling us with all this happening in the spiritual realm, the only way to win the battle is to suit up in the armor that God has provided. Now when we think about suiting up, we now see the reason why we need to. But I thought about the United States Army. You can't suit up in the gear. Come on, veterans. You can't suit up in the Army gear unless you first took the time to enlist in the Army. Which means that a soldier that tries to go out into the battle that hasn't enlisted doesn't have access to the armor that he needs to suit up in to protect his life. Come on, y'all. If you don't take the time to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, every time you walk out of these doors out of your house, you're walking out unprotected. But when you give your life to Jesus, he not only covers you in his blood, he tells you now that you've enlisted, you've got to go through some basic training. And when you go through basic training, he starts passing out to you the armor so that you can suit up. And so here Paul is telling us the reason why the believer can win in the midst of chaos, the first point is we've got a fearless leader. The Bible says be strong in the Lord, <laughs> which means that
that if, if he's telling us to be strong in the Lord, it means that the Lord is able to hold us and keep us so that when we can't lean on ourselves, we can lean on the Lord. He is a fearless leader. The Bible says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. Now, when people are seated, that typically means they're not worried. He's not standing. He's not looking over trying to see what's happening. He's seated positionally at the right hand of God. In other words, Jesus is chilling. No matter what's happening here on the earth or in our lives, he already knows that we're going to win, so he's just chilling. And because we're seated next to him in the heavenly places, the mindset that we ought to have, just chill. Because you know what? I'm seated next to Jesus. I'm walking with the Lord. I'm suited with him. And when we start walking around with that mindset, we can win in the midst of chaos every day. And it does not mean that it will be easy. There will be some days that are harder than others. There will be some clear hills that will cause you to struggle. I think about when, you, when I go hiking and I'm trying to go up that hill. There are some hills I have to stop and I have to take my breath and I gotta have 50,000 bottles of water because it's hard. But guess what? I've got to keep climbing even when it's difficult because I made a commitment to get to the destination. And the good thing is, is that while we are climbing, our fearless leader, Jesus, the son of God, he sits there and he cheers us on all the way. And just like Jesus is not confused about who he is. He actually knows that he's the son of God. When we wake up every day and actually remember that we are sons and daughters of the most high God, you walk out of the house doors a little bit differently. I'm a daddy's girl and everybody knows I love my dad. I love my mom too, but I'm a daddy's girl, okay? Whatever my daddy tells me, I believe it. If daddy says he's going to do something, I know it's going to happen. Well, Jesus is a better father. <laughs> and whatever he says, he will actually do it. And so since the Bible tells me that I am a son and a daughter of the Most High God and that I am in a royal priesthood, that means that I can walk out that house every day with my head up, no matter what job I have, no matter how much money I have in the bank, no matter how I feel, I can walk out that door knowing that I am a child of God. Number two, how is the Christian guaranteed victory amidst chaos? The fight has been fixed. Your fight on this earth has already been set for you to win. Can I say that again? You have already been positionally put here with a winning heart and a willing mind because God has already fixed the fight. Stephanie, why do you say that? The Bible says, put on the full armor of God. The last part is the most important part. Put on the full armor of God. Who does the armor belong to? Who created the armor? Huh. The Bible tells us if we keep going down uh, uh, to chapter, to verse 10, he starts telling us about the different pieces of armor. But the part that I want to focus on is who the designer of the armor is. Would God tell you to put on the full armor that he designed if he created in it in a way that would cause you to lose? Would God tell you 
to put on the full armor of God if he had not already created it in such a way that it's designed to protect you all the way? To not believe in the armor means you don't believe in the ability of the designer. But when you believe in the ability of the designer and you put your armor on, you can walk in victory into the battle because the designer of the armor has already fixed the fight for you to win. What are you saying, Stephanie? When I come dressed and ready for battle, I don't have to wait until the battle is over to start shouting for victory. All I've got to do is know that when I put the armor on, even in the midst of my bedroom, on my knees, I can say, thank you, Jesus. I'm dressed in your armor. So as I go out today, I know that I'm covered because I trust the one that designed what I'm wearing. And you are covered, my dear brothers and sisters. The last thing we see in this text, it tells us that not only was the armor designed to protect us from the enemy, the armor was also designed to sustain our life, to enjoy the blessing. No armor, a soldier goes into battle and he's completely exposed to the attack. And when he's killed, that's it. But when we go into the battle armed in the armor of God, He's not just protecting us for the present. He's protecting us for eternity. God's protection for you is not just for today. When you enlist in the army, he says, wear this for the rest of your life so that when you see me, you're not only prepared, but you actually enjoy an abundant life in the process. The armor secures the blessing by protecting you from being exposed to the enemy's attacks that would try to block the blessing that God has for you. And so God says, I need you to really see why I told you to put on the whole armor of God. Because the last thing we see in this text is that the role the believer has when encountering a battle is to remain a faithful servant. When you're wearing God's armor, you trust him you trust the fact that he's placed you there, that he's got everything under the control, and so the Bible says, stand. Stand. Stand firm in your faith. Standing firm means not running away when it gets hard. Coming to Christ does not mean it's going to be easy. But when you come to Christ, it does mean that he gives you everything you need to make you able to stand. By standing in position because of what God has done, we're saying we're not looking at ourselves, we're depending on God. When we begin putting on this winning mindset, we understand that no matter what happens, God has already positioned me to win this. You can win the battle when you know who's fighting with you. David says in Psalms 27 and 3, one of my favorite scriptures, he says, I would have fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So no matter what's happening in the spiritual realm, God has protection for you in the earthly realm so that he can keep you while you're living here and then God will come and get us and receive us and take us to the place that Jesus is preparing for us. To me, it sounds like a well-rounded project that has been secured. Now is secured for you and heaven is secured for you as well. So when we think about the church, 
and we think about every person coming through those doors all armored up. People start asking you questions like, well, what are y'all doing during transition? You can tell them we're winning. That's what we're doing. We're winning. And you know why we can tell them that we're winning? Because the purpose of the church, it didn't belong to Pastor Ellis. It didn't belong to Minister Justin. It actually belonged to God. And so because it belonged to God, no matter what transition is happening, we are winning. Because God decided to make Pilgrim a church that's planted by the rivers of water. And the Bible tells us that when you're planted by the rivers of water, you bring Bring forth fruit in your due season. So even in transition, the planting and the roots of the church run pretty down deep. We It's down, down so deep that even when the wind blows, it can't shake, pilgrim, because we've got deep roots. Our roots are in God and not man. So what are we doing? We're winning. What are we doing? We're winning because God has created for the church. I love this because when I started thinking about winning, I thought about how the enemy actually thought that he was winning the war when he saw Jesus. I mean, can you imagine? The devil was like, hey, they didn't, they didn't arrested him. They got him in chains. He's sitting on the sidelines smiling. And then he probably felt really good when they start beating him, right? And I can see the devil saying, yeah, yeah, we got him now. And then he probably felt real good when, they, when he saw them put him on a cross and nail his right hand and nail his left hand and nail his feet. The devil was sitting there thinking, they got, I got him now. There's no place for him to go. God hasn't come down to get him. He's about to go down. And before you knew it, the, the Bible says that Jesus died on an old rugged cross. But I'm so glad that when the devil thought he was out, the devil couldn't stop him. Three days he laid there. Friday night he was there. The devil thought he got away. The Bible says that on Saturday, he was still laying there. But early Sunday morning, the Bible says he got up. He got up. He got up. With all. got up with all power not some power not this much power but all power yeah power to live right power to say right power to walk with me power to talk with me power to keep me and shake me and make me yeah yeah what you're going through you are a winner God said it I believe it and that 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 settles it tell you to just say I'm winning I'm winning I'm winning I'm winning I'm winning winning 
in the midst of chaos. Chaos and winning. Chaos but winning. Attacks coming in your mind, you're still winning because you're a daughter of the Most High God. And I declare the word of God over your mind right now that no evil shall befall you. No calamity shall come now your dwelling for the blood of Jesus transcends from heaven and touches your mind, touches your body, touches your house, touches your finances. You are winning. Amen. Let's celebrate God for our powerful word. Winning in the midst of chaos. In any war, there is strategies, there's complexities. There's nuance to win that war. Even more so when it comes to spiritual warfare. On one hand, it's, it's exciting, it's, it's enthralling, it's so much energy and enthusiasm when we talk about fighting and defeating Satan. But on the other side of that, there's this reality that Jesus himself states and confirms in John 10 that that enemy that we're fighting comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. Yeah, the nuance of spiritual warfare is, as Sister Stephanie said to us, it takes place in high and heavenly places, which means it's a war that we can't see. How do you fight against an enemy that you can't see? We have too many cute, paraphrases stomping on the devil's feet and again how can you stomp on somebody's feet that you can't see he's fooled us into thinking that 